she was looking for colouring in pages for her children while they're all at home during the lockdown. And an ad for Pornhub came up. Now, this is the biggest global pornography hosting platform in the world. And that's an ad that came up while she was looking for colouring in pages for children, which a child could have been looking for. Welcome to another episode of This Catholic Life, conversations about life's ups and downs, big and small, how we deal with every situation imaginable, whatever life throws at us, but still manage to be sensible, practical and joyful. Today's show is Destroying Sex, uh, about a scourge in our society that's destroying sex lives, destroying relationships and destroying communities. That sounds awfully negative, but we've got some positive stories to tell, hopefully by the end of today. I'm your host, Peter Holmes, and today I'm joined by my guest, Melinda tankard Rice, who is an author, speaker, media commentator, blogger, advocate for women and girls. She's best known for her work in addressing sexualization, objectification, harms of pornography, sexual exploitation, trafficking, violence against women. And she's the author of six books, an opinion writer, regular TV and radio appearant, if that's, that's the right word, and co-founder of a grassroots campaigning movement called Collective Shout for a world free of sexploitation. It's a very great pleasure to welcome you, Melinda. Thanks for the opportunity, Peter. A full disclosure, I have known Melinda for some time now, although I don't claim to have had any part in her excellent work, amazing work. I've seen, watched from a distance in awe, uh, but uh, very glad to have you back to talk about this very important topic. Before we get started, just a reminder that if you like the show, you should just subscribe on your podcast app. That way you won't miss an episode. Let's dive straight in. Destroying sex. Why did I call it this, this topic? Because what we're talking about here. Uh, pornography, which isn't just about the specific uh, act of looking at images, etc., in some weird way, about the entire culture of it and its effect, is in fact, uh, there's, it's a pun in the name there, it's not just a destroying our sex lives, it's a destructive sexuality, it's a destructive world, if you like. Um, so this is a conversation about things that are passed off as harmless or even healthy, but which actually turn out to be destructive in many ways. Let's begin with the ugly story behind this whole work. What I mean, when I first met you, Melinda, you weren't specifically focused on this area, but uh, what what actually alerted you to this need? And obviously something that's now a, a passion and a life work for you. Yes, Peter. Well, it really began more than a decade ago. I've always felt that I'm supposed to, I'm called to write on issues that don't get enough attention. And I started to notice some global research on the harms of objectifying women and sexualizing girls. And I felt that there needed to be more attention given to this here in Australia. So I, and I, I, not only the research, but I was also seeing the impact on girls in my own, my own life, my own, my own family, my girlfriends, daughters. And I could see that their lives were being impacted by these toxic messages about their bodies, about relationships, about sexuality, about where their true value lay. So I decided to write a book and my publisher, Spinifex Press, was very happy to engage uh, in that project. And that book was called Getting Real, Challenging the Sexualization of Girls. It went on to become the biggest selling title for Spinifex Press, so clearly struck a chord. And the book gathered all of the, the global data on the harms of reducing girls to the sum of their sexual parts. And then people started to contact me and say, look, the research on this is solid. We know that it's sexualization is contributing to depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, self-harm, poor academic performance. And But what can we do about it? So I noticed that girls were getting a very limited and distorted idea about bodies, relationships and sexuality conveyed to them through advertising, marketing, billboards, through what they were seeing on social media, through fashion magazines, music video clips. And they were being taught that their value lay in their ability to attract sexual attention, to be on display. It's not just limited to those things, isn't it? This gets picked up and it becomes a social expectation in their own communities. It becomes a social expectation. It's the, the wallpaper uh, against which we are trying to raise happy, healthy, resilient young people. It's the, really the dominant script of their lives 
is being able to uh, perform uh, a certain sexuality. Uh, they're actually not that in touch with their own bodies and their own sexuality, but they they understand that they're supposed to uh, perform and be attractive, conform to a certain body look and shape and it, it's a cause of great misery and despair so i and a lot of parents a lot of your parents will have seen this why why don't we value them and affirm them for uh their desire to make a difference in the world for their their faith for their art for their poetry for their goodness for wanting to help other mm. people for example why are those yeah, for kindness and, being, and intelligence yeah, and things like that exactly intelligence, including emotional intelligence, which I think we need more of <laughs> than ever today. So it just I just felt compelled to uh, make my, my next book on that subject, wrote the book, and it, it, it struck a chord, became the biggest selling title for my publisher, Spinifex Press. But people were writing to me and saying, okay, it's great, you've collated the research, you've given us expert opinion, what can we do about it? Where's the grassroots movement that we can join to try to impact change. And a lot of people felt lonely. They felt they thought maybe there was something wrong with them for being upset by this. Uh, but then they yeah. realised, well, actually, no, uh, their feelings echoed that of so many other uh, parents and anyone yeah. really that cares about girls. So one of the contributors to my book said, your book is a collective shout against the pornification of culture. And those two words leapt out at me and basically I decided to start a movement and that was 10 years ago and that's really how right. the work began and because and the that's the name of your organization now yeah, collective Shout for a world free of sex exploitation and because the book proved so popular that's really what led me to being invited into schools schools were already seeing this problem they were already seeing girls suffering anxiety around their bodies, how they looked, uh, whether yep. they were hot or not. Is that contributing to things like self-harm and, uh, you know, mental health problems, those kinds of things as Correct. well? Is that Obviously, connected? mental health is complex, but all of the global literature that I've been studying now for over 10 years makes linkages uh, between what we tell girls about how they should look and act and be in the world and negative mental health comes. It's solid. The jury isn't even out on this. And increasingly, those messages are affecting our young men as well. So, so that's how it began. It began as a research interest, but also seeing the impact on girls in my own lives. I have uh, four children, three three daughters, and, you know, they were born to me. <laughs> you know, they've had these messages since they were little, and yet even <laughs> I found it hard to compete with the dominant narrative of the culture. When we talk about the dominant narrative, Yes. We're not, I mean, parents like to think that they have a big influence, and we do. We have a big influence on our kids, and our attitudes mm. and affirmation uh, ends up defining what they find as worthwhile. But, but we're only, we, we, I think we're not quite aware of how prevalent and how, how pervasive things such as the internet mechanisms, social media, television, these sorts of things are in our kids' lives. That's right. That's right, Peter. We can't be naive about this, and. I've been researching this full time for a long time and I can tell you that even in the last two years I've seen things get worse. The stories that I used to hear from uh, older girls, say year 11 and 12, I'm now hearing from girls in primary school. Uh, the level of imposition on their lives, the level of sexual harassment, the demands to send sexual pictures uh, the groping, being groped at school, having this is this is in primary school. You're talking about people being groped in stories school. Stories are increasing, uh, increasingly coming from primary school. So children acting out, uh, boys acting out sexually on girls at school. We've seen a rise on child on child sexual assault at rates never seen in in history. We've and is this between it. children, like between people of similar age? You're talking about here? Uh, yes, or sometimes a boy might be a year or two older. That's quite but frightening. Very frightening and distressing stories. And in all schools, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, public school or faith-based school, whether it's high socioeconomic area, low, religious or not, uh, the stories are the same and they are, and they are getting worse. Um, so I've so become this, increasingly this, this... disturbed by this. 
This sounds like, though, uh, uh, almost like it's not accidental, that it seems to be a concerted campaign. Um, and certainly the way advertising algorithms seem to work, I must admit, when I did my uh, internet research on this particular topic before I mm. came on, unfortunately, now my Facebook feed is throwing up things that I, I wish yes. it didn't. Um, so there's a kind of a, there's a direct response. So once Correct. once you have uh, this kind of, um, they, once they detect that I'm a male, for example, Google mm. ads and other ads start throwing up things they think I might be interested in. And Correct. There's, there seems to be a targeted thing, but is that, surely yes. that's not targeted at children. Yes, it is. It is targeted. We need to be, we need to be a little bit cautious about talking about accidental exposure. I heard one of the most chilling presentations of my life at a sexual exploitation summit in Washington, D.C. two years ago by a woman professor who had researched the deliberate exposure to porn by the global pornography industry and it just sent chills up my spine, dropping porn-related content into the feeds of boys, knowing when the boys were online, how long they were online for, what kind of sites they were visiting. Just this week, Peter, I was contacted by a mother who said she was researching, she was looking for colouring in pages for her children while they're all at home during the lockdown and an ad for Pornhub came up. Now, this is the biggest global pornography hosting platform in the world. And that's an ad that came up while she was looking for colouring in pages for children, which a child could have been looking for. Children being exposed through their favourite cartoon characters. Pornhub has an entire genre of porn based on the favourite, most loved Disney characters, for example. Right. If, if as an individual, if we caught an individual person who had used, you know, a child's favourite favorite cartoon characters to engage them sexually in some way, that Correct. could be prosecutable, surely. Well, unfortunately, in the United States, the free speech trumps pretty much everything. Right. And uh, we haven't uh well we have an ongoing campaign on this right now as we speak against Pornhub but we have found trafficked children on Pornhub uh ourselves and our colleagues in the the US that we work very closely with at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation uh we have found you know we've documented child sexual exploitation material uh, on Pornhub also might I add on Instagram this is how mainstream this has become and uh, there hasn't been any action. Pornhub is owned by MindGeek, which is a Canadian uh, company. And we have we are part of a campaign which is now approaching 1 million signatures to get this investigated, to get Pornhub investigated because of the kind of content, the racist content, the anti-Semitic content is just di absolutely evil and diabolical. I, I can't find any other other words that come close to describing what is there and what our children are being exposed to yeah with due respect though surely the i mean racism is awful uh, uh anti-semitic stuff is obviously abhorrent but we're talking about something that goes like this is combined with the abhorrent evil of just treating other human beings as if they're there for our gratification and that you can mistreat someone in fact people seem to be getting their thrills out of deliberately mistreating someone, not being indifferent, but actually that's, actively that's mistreating. Correct. So the violent genres of pornography are the most popular. Brutalisation wow. of women, degradation, uh, violent ab abuse, the, the, the most horrible things which may not even make it to air on your program, Peter. Right. But it's not, this isn't about healthy connection. This isn't about intimacy, authentic human connection. This is about... Right all the ways that you can degrade women with children, you know, their sexual templates are still developing. So we right. are arousing children, young boys in particular, to be aroused by extreme violence against women. So on the one hand, we condemn violence against women and we have significant amount of money going into trying to address the epidemic of violence against women at the same time. The, the biggest porn hosting sites in the world are profiting from that very same violence. They have entire genres. Domestic violence porn is a genre. Right. That's just horrifying. 
But let, let's let's address one thing that's often brought up in this case. Um, mm. I've I've seen your Twitter feeds, unfortunately, and I, mm. I'm really I don't know how you do it and stay sane. But some of the things that come back at you are, oh, you this think is I'm just sane, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, look, honestly, it's a miracle that you're here standing it's still. <laughs> well, the, I, I'm um... very intentional about looking after myself. We debrief most days, my colleagues and I. I have, Fantastic. you know, certain spiritual disciplines in my life and I've worked, I have work very hard not to go under, believe me, and okay. there are times where I take a significant amount of time where I don't look at anything online, particularly over You'd Christmas. almost have to. It's just a It's the only now. way because, you know, yeah. you, sometimes you can feel yourself spiralling down you know, yep. mentally. I also have a lot of very good friends that support me and support my work. And, and I get great feedback as well. Sorry, I've just taken you good. off on a little bit of a That's tangent all right. there. But- Coming back to what I was saying is that I, I often see this negative c- coming back at you from yes. what you would hope were reasonable people. Um, <laughs> but that, but they're saying things such as, uh, there's two things I've noticed, two arguments I'd like you to sort of uh, give an answer to. One mm. is that um, this is just a fantasy. It doesn't actually play out in real life. Now, I know that's not mm. true. So I'd like you to talk mm. about that. And the second mm. one is, isn't it better if someone feels this way that they play this out in a fantasy thing mm. rather than in real life? So I mm. guess the, the main sure. question is, can we observe and have we tracked the 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 behaviour playing itself out, like the connection, if you like, yes. from the porn to the so real look, life? You, you, it's not, it's not a, you're not hung up about sexuality and prudish and a, a wowser and a moraliser to say that rape, torture porn, sadism porn, incest porn and... Uh, uh, bestiality are a problem and uh, distorting no, no, and warping not. sexuality. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, that is an entire genre of, of rape porn. And to say that it's a fantasy, well, you know, who's been used to make the porn? Whose bodies are being traded globally to make the porn? Yeah, you know, it's not a fantasy for those women and those girls who are yep. already vulnerable. And we're going to see a rise of that right now with global mass unemployment, millions of women losing their jobs around the world, women already Mm. vulnerable, and this industry will prey on them. It's happening. It's happening right now. And also fantasy, attitudes shape behaviours. And if you contribute to attitudes that say that women should be raped and tortured and treated sadistically, you will see an outworking of that. Um, Yeah. Porn is a pathway to actual real lived violence against women. So, just look looking through the the effects that we've noticed. I mean, I'm I'm studying masculinity, but the, the effects I've noticed is that men who have been exposed to pornography on uh, uh, at all hmm. often start to normalise this kind of violent behaviour, and they they normalise the expectations of women's availability and and Correct. their willingness and in fact that in fact free will is not really an issue with some of them i think you were mentioning in one of your talks uh the fact that there's actual men's fashion for young for even for young teenagers which have like rape jokes on them basically Correct. and there's That's it's right. a kind of a normalization of this thing we by the way we actually banned those on on the campus of notre dame and had good know, sent anyone off with them yeah um, good but also you're seeing men and this is something i'd say to men who are just sitting and think this is just all you know wowzers men it actually st- like it makes you impotent <laughs> to, to it rewires your brain the, one of the proofs that this is actually porn is actually affecting brain patterns is that more and more men um, are presenting with impotence at a very young age because they're so addicted to porn they can't have a normal human relationship they're incapable of that and that means that their mind is being affected in all of their relationships it's not just about their sexual activity it's about how they think about every single person they meet correct um, and so if, even if that was the only thing there that would be enough to to tackle it surely but in practice what we're seeing and what i'm hearing from your talks melinda is that you're seeing a rise in very specific uh sexual violence and sexual attitudes so let's separate there's two things there so uh yes the impact on male sexuality is significant and for the first time in history we're seeing teenage boys with erectile dysfunction and you know sometimes if i feel i'm not getting through to the boys you start talking about that and all of a sudden they're interested yes. tragically i wish they were interested because of the brutality of their fellow human beings uh, yes, br- they brutality be. against women would you know, I say to them, you know, boys, if you're, you're consuming porn, you've become a patron of the global sex industry, whether you think you have or not. 
you know, you're contributing. You would say you're against trafficking in women, but, you know, you're, you, every download is driving that global trade. Uh, but if I can't get through to them with an ethical argument, uh, then, and thankfully I've had boys say to me they stopped using because of that argument, uh, but then there are other boys that need to, you need to approach them through a purely self-interest argument before you can even address the ethics and that's, you know, boys, you you will end up impotent, you'll end up with erectile dysfunction. There's some research out on this, it's quite diabolical, about early exposure to porn, seven, eight, nine years of age, and then some boys ending up consuming it, you know, eight to 10, 12 hours. Sometimes they're on mm. looking, you know, consuming. It's more than looking, consuming all night. And what kind of a life is that? You know, again, yeah. this week I was contacted by a friend of a mother whose uh, autistic son had been exposed to porn at another person's house. He's 13 and now he's trying to sneak onto every device in the family home to to, to view it and to consume it. It is actually an addiction of, of a... a- because you get a there's a like a dopamine hit that mm. um that especially I don't know if it's true actually I'm I'm assuming especially males but it might not be correct have you seen any research on the distinction between there's not enough research but um, anecdotally I'm hearing from uh, more women for whom it's become a problem but women again there's not enough research on this but they're yeah. not looking at the really hardcore stuff they're not spending the same time on those those sites and often they're looking for uh, some sign of intimacy they're looking for a quote-unquote romantic storyline so right okay. and, and often what women tell me is that they watch it they consume it because their boyfriend partner hookup slash husband whoever it is wants them to that's that's often the entry, so it's, it's entry fulfilling point. an expectation more than and and then in their desire Correct. for intimacy they're trying to, to tick the boxes which they think will get them there so that Correct. that would explain for example the the rise in people uh, looking for bizarre cosmetic surgery at a very young age um, yeah that, well that's another heartbreak is the increase in cosmetic surgery including um, genital surgery in girls which has increased 50 percent in the oh. 15 to 24 age group. Uh, in this country so you know we condemn female genital mutilation in other countries what what are we Mm. doing to girls here you see there's always someone ready to make money off the body angst of girls and and young women and this is again how porn culture has infected every aspect every aspect of life where women feel they have to conform to a, a, a porn shaped norm uh to be to be acceptable to be to be yeah. women. And the stories that women are telling me about having to submit to sexual acts that they don't enjoy or want, but they think they need to do that. And I, I won't get too specific because you'll have to cut it all out. But From a human perspective, mm. uh, intimacy should be about a self-giving love which seeks and desires the joy and the fulfilment and flourishing of the other person. And in every way that any kind of pretense at intimacy which damages the other person or treats them mm. as an object Yes. Um, is simply not compatible with that. Can we That's get right. positive perhaps and, and push towards um, what's the, I mean, th- we could be quite easily, as you mentioned before, swept up in despair if we're looking at the size of this industry and, and the size yes. of the kind of effect and how easy it is to get access. I mean, when I was a young lad, um, the, the the naughty kids in my year level would be, have to sneak down to the local service station and grab mm. a nudie mag, yeah. whereas now it's it's so prevalent that any device, any kind of thing, and, and even advertising and, and everywhere is just pushing this image at us, even if it's not yes. explicit, it's still got the intimation and the hints of the porn industry. Yes. Um, how can we make a difference? Specifically, how can parents and young people who are trying to set an example and live a, a, a life that's uh, kind of natural and free of this sort of thing? Because you don't want to yes. go into our shell and become ultra prudes we don't want to sort of say no sex please you know that's just all awful that's not what this message is about not remotely in fact it's a pro-sex message it's a pro-healthy sexuality message uh this is not about um, body shaming bodies are beautiful and 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 works of art and wonder and amazement and this is really a fight a fight for love and you know it may sound a little bit i don't know naff or something but actually i think what we are witnessing is, uh, is the death of love if we don't do something about it. And this is what I say to, to young people, you know, 
this porn industry is destroying your ability to know and experience what what real love is like true intimacy which will which will really blow your mind um in a way that the fake industrialized commodified commercialized porn version will not ever do for you uh, here's a sad little anecdote before i get onto the positive um a young man said you know, we are not aroused by human touch. We're aroused by a screen. We walk into a room, we see a screen and we're aroused. So they're being aroused by a disembodied piece of plastic uh, sitting on their desk, on their bed, wherever. It's the screens that arouse them. And Peter, we're probably of a similar vintage, but you may recall, I certainly do, <laughs> when your hand first brushed the hand of someone you had an interest in and just yes. how powerful that was. But now we have boys saying, uh, that doesn't do anything for us because what yeah. is on the screen is this huge harem which, you know, hyperactivates the appetite, the sexual appetite system, and no real person can compete with that. But to talk about positives, I have to talk about positives or I would not be able to continue <laughs> to do this work for as long as I have. And, you know, I am so thankful that there are positive stories to tell so from the girls, for a start, I have girls saying to me, probably the most common response, I have a right to say no and not feel bad about it. Girls saying, oh, I thought we had to endure this. I thought we had to put up with the sexual comments, the sexist treatment. The Isn't it remarkable in an age when we're so, we think we imagine ourselves free of this kind of level of, no. you, you think that kind of sexism is from the 1950s, but in this age, it's just remarkable that our kids don't seem to have got this message. Correct. It's just, as we said, normalised everywhere. Uh, and girls are in bearing the brunt of that. And they suddenly the t lights turn on the, and they realise, oh, we don't have to live like this. We can demand something better. We don't have to put up with this. So they're You're worth working. more than that. They're worth yeah. more than that. And that's very beneficial for me to hear that. And mm. I have boys also increasingly saying to me, we don't want to be that kind of man. We we want to be good men. We want to have good, healthy friendships, relationships with with women and girls. We don't want to reduce every girl to the some of their sexual parts and be mentally undressing them every time we see them, you know, help us to be better. They want to be young men who are emotionally literate, who are empathetic, who are kind. And, mm. you know, thank God I have more young men wanting to work with me, wanting to join my, my team. I have a young man now coming into schools with me, uh, Daniel from Sydney, and he's just got a beautiful way of communicating uh, with the boys and helping them to see that they're being ripped off as well. Uh, yes, that's, girls that's are That's a the good ones, way to put it. They're being yeah, ripped off. They're being they, denied they something that's natural They're being denied something good. that would be good in yeah. their lives and they're being brutalised and given a very destructive idea about about masculinity, uh, which, which is debased and ugly. One of the things, though, is that the kids this age famously – aren't mm. great at making good decisions about their lives. And the reason we don't give them adult privileges in, in other things like driving cars and, and which they probably physically are capable of, mm. but we don't give them the privilege of driving a car is because they don't generally make great decisions mm. because they're not thinking through the consequences of actions very well. They're looking for the thrill and not really thinking through the consequences. Well, their brains are still under development and they're That's not right. cognitively and equipped to be able to navigate this without help. So putting them in a room, for example, with with free internet and no one watching is almost like inviting disaster. So well, you're as a parent... Them, you're giving them a hand grenade. If you give your child an internet-enabled device, you are giving them a hand grenade which will blow up in their face. The number of parents contacting us at Collective Shout and telling us that their child uh, was approached by a predator uh, on their through their device, whether they're on Instagram or Kik or TikTok or wherever, uh, predators are more active than ever right now, parents just saying, uh, you have to know how at risk your child is. And the stories I'm hearing are from, quote, unquote, you know, families that think they're doing all the right things. And yep. they've discovered to their horror that their child has sent a sexual image to a predator. Even if even if someone is not like the, the dastardly sort of stereotypical image of, a you know, an older man predator or something, it could just be that the general atmosphere of the expectation of you've got to look sexy in your selfies, you've got to, 
you know you, that sort of reinforcement of of the porn culture of the, the you are worth what you look like kind of thing uh, can be quite damaging to their their self esteem and their it's, it's yes it's massively massively damaged damaging and it's very difficult for us to compete with that but another way that uh, is a, a, a positive force to address porn culture and all its resultant harms is is collective shout and we're we're 10 years old and we've had major victories in Australia and globally against advertisers corporations marketers the sex industry who objectify women and sexualize girls to to sell things and we had some last year was possibly our biggest year of victories we had a major victory against two long standing porn magazines that have existed in Australia uh, up to 80, 80 years in publication, and that's Picture and People magazine. And first of all, within less than three weeks, we got them out of every 7-Eleven store in the country. We said you can't have these degrading, debased magazines next to, uh, you know, Slurpees and Krispy Kremes and just normalising it. And so the CEO of 7-Eleven responded, got them out of 700 stores. Then BP responded a week later and got them out of every BP service station. Then the CEO of Bauer Media Group called me into his Sydney office and to my astonishment said, uh, everything you've said is true. It's indefensible that we would be publishing these magazines uh, in the 21st century. And uh, he he got rid of them. They went under. And that campaign <laughs> all up took probably four or five weeks. Um, so there are good things happening. We're informing uh, so social policy, the development of um, government a- responses on these issues. We've had a, a major inquiry into the need for age verification in Australia so that kids can't just uh, enter porn sites without some proof of age. Uh, we have inquiries into trafficking and modern slavery. We have inquiries. Uh, this is all in the last one to two years into the failures of our uh, advertising regulation system. What a joke that is. Self-regulation, which allows pornified portrayals of women floor to ceiling in our family shopping malls, for example, through the store Honey Burdette. And even in companies, even ethical investment companies that pride themselves on their values and their mission statements about responsible investment, corporate social responsibility, having an ethical framework around investment, 15 of those super ethical investment companies invest in the property groups, which are essentially the landlords to the tenants, Honey Burdett, which is allowed to display full-sized pornographic images of women so we're talking about an, a need for a change of a change of Correct. mentality that if they can think that um, it becomes ethical somehow because they're one step removed in terms of a landlord etc or the enabling thing because I've, I've seen your campaign against the, mm. these particular shopping centers and they're simply mm. not responding adequately no they're certainly not but we've had two good responses and uh, one was from Ca- Catholic Super. We're very pleased with the response of Catholic Super. So you can stay invested with Catholic Super. And uh, <laughs> invest as well, notified. And so Catholic Super decided to divest their shares in those property groups. And Ethi Invest notified uh, Westfield of an ethical downgrade. Uh, but other companies have been very disappointing, including Mercy Super. Very disappointed right. with Mercy Super's response. Now, you can't just say, oh, it's a small part of our overall portfolio or it only gives us this percentage of profits. You wouldn't run that argument with tobacco if you were wanting to call yourself <laughs> an ethical investment company, right? You wouldn't Which, run it, Melinda, with anything that was unethical. Right? You wouldn't you can't you can't do that. And companies Mercy Super, for example, uh, prides itself on putting women front and centre. Well, you can't say that and invest in property groups that take no action against Honey Burdett when the global research, the biggest report of its kind in the world, said that objectifying women and sexualizing girls contributes to a diminished view of women's competence, morality and humanity. That's how serious this issue is. It leads to a raft of flow-on human rights violations against women and girls. So don't call yourself ethical if uh, you can't, if you're not <laughs> acting that way. That comes down to individuals too. Sure. So uh, 
one of the things that um, I've really liked about watching Collective Shout is that compared to other organisations, that because of the very, very understandable anger and mm. frustration with a kind of indifference and even a positive view towards por pornographic culture by men, and I noticed, for example, that SBS was it ran a, a series in uh, radio sort of positive thing towards porn um, recently. Well, that was uh, actually our ABC as well. Right, uh, okay. ABC uh, Triple J Hack did a very a positive program about all the benefits of porn and just right. skated over the negatives. And, you know, this program has listened to a lot of young young people. Yeah. So we spoke yeah. on that as well. So so the point my point is there that given that there's a genuine angst and a genuine uh, anger coming out of a lot of hurt from young women mm. and, and and people like yourself who fought this for so long, there tends to be, when I jump on um, and try to, you know, get involved in it, uh, mm. if you happen to utter a phrase such as, now I haven't actually written this because I'm aware of it, but if you if you see a young man write something like, not all men are like this, suddenly there's a flare up <laughs> and an angry response saying, you know what, um, most are. And I've personally been involved in, um, because I'm in a, a fairly sheltered generally friendship group i i don't see the impact as much but what i've have seen is when i worked in counseling in melbourne and when i was involved in now for 10 years teaching at notre dame the you start seeing the impact is much much more prevalent than you realize and that um the attitudes of young men are being formed sometimes against their will but it's still a formation of a kind and when we're seeing a, a friend of mine works in the in, in a court system, which I won't name, but basically the kinds of cases they're seeing coming through, uh, the very serious sort of sharp end of this kind of crisis, are getting more and more prevalent and more and more violent, uh, especially yes. when we're seeing violence against women, in particular sexual violence and dominance involved in sexual violence yes. coming through. This is a problem which is a masculine problem. Now, I'm not saying all men, therefore, because they're men, are the cause, but it is in our court to respond, to not tolerate anything that looks like this Correct. anywhere, language, jokes, attitudes, any kind of lewd uh, innuendos, um, suggestions that women should behave certain ways or that it's right that they do so or that it's desirable that they do so. Correct. Uh, for the man, it, it, I'm going on a little rant here, so please forgive me, but in, in my opinion, there's no woman that I've met who has a problem with a man who is... A safe place not just a safe place in that he doesn't threaten her but that nobody it, that no such behavior is tolerated you know yeah. that, that that their own flourishing is up to them their own free will is up to them but anyone who impinges upon that or suggests that they should be in any way uh, bonafide that the, the guy is not going to tolerate that yes i don't think that there's there's an impression that the men are being pushed aside and told they're all bad that's not the impression i get from collective shout because there are men involved with collective shout and and pushing there, hard. There certainly are. What what troubles me about the not all men argument is that it's often an, a knee jerk reaction. It's a defensive reaction, often by those who don't actually want to examine the problem and acknowledge how bad it is. So you can say not all men over and over again, but too, there are too many. There are too many men, and. We have yeah. to look well, at one this one would be too many, formation. but there are it's many one more than one. One is too many, of course. Yeah. But you know the stories that I have to endure every day of of my life, uh, as I said, getting getting younger. What is happening with with formation? Why why do so many women think it's a, a, a very rare thing to to come across a, a a decent man? This is an absolute tragedy. I'm going to give you an example. I was in a western suburb. A public uh, art tech college recently with my colleague Daniel and Daniel was speaking to the student and a girl just started crying and we we, we stopped and we said why, why are you crying she said I've just I don't hear any men in my life in my world amongst my peers ever talking in a way that Daniel is talking about genuine love and care and respect for women this was like something new for her and she was so profoundly affected that she couldn't stop crying because she said, I don't hear this. I'm, I'm going to give you another example um, and maybe this one can't go to air, but I had a young woman tell me that when she's on dating sites, 
she lists wanting to make love slowly and stare lovingly into someone's eyes. She says she lists that as a fetish because otherwise it won't get considered. So that has to be seen as something really weird, you know. Yeah. Uh, so unfortunately, the not all men knee-jerk response is almost used as a big fat full stop. We're not even going right. to discuss this. Or you may not accuse me or imply I'm that I am like in any that. way. Yeah. Therefore, or I know lots of good men. Therefore, you know, you're exaggerating. Yeah. You're making this up. Uh, thank, thankfully, at Collective Shout, you know, we have we do have good men involved, thankfully, and great men that advise us, that recommend us, that uh, join with us in our cause in Australia and and globally. And there are some, yeah. some really good men speaking out on porn, speaking out on porn culture, um, and that's that's been fantastic uh, for us. Any man can get involved in collective shout. Anyone, any, it's anyone. It's very can important get to have that positive outlet, and and young men in particular do have. Yes. I mean, if you if you challenge them, they will yes. rise to the challenge. And it, and if you give them, I, I, this is why I'm I'm quite happy to to mention collective shout and similar. Although there's not many of that are similar to you guys uh, who are standing up about this because this is a you know this is a dragon to slay this is a, a sure. fight which calls for that that urge in all of us young men yes. and women to stand up and say this no we're not taking this crap we we can yes. stand up to this and and in fact instead of just sitting back and being overwhelmed by the victimhood or by by mm. being you know oh we can't change this it's worth fighting, even if mm. even if they're not listening right now. It's worth fighting because that yeah. changes who we are. It says what we're prepared to accept. It Correct. says what we're prepared to put up with. That's right, and we need to encourage those those good boys because it can feel very lonely for them, be very isolating for them to step outside that pack mentality, to not go along with what the other boys are doing, um, to not engage in that brutalization and. Uh, demeaning of girls one one of the positive things i've seen melinda is, is mm. that um when i've been involved in youth retreats and and um and young talking to young people often mm. the young men when they've heard a, a talk similar to this although mm. it's often um i wish they could hear you but they, it, they've heard someone just talk frankly about their struggle with pornography yeah. many of them have actually joined in accountability like mutual accountability groups like they've kept encouraging each other yes. and so they've turned the peer into a positive rather than a negative yes um, that's good and so they're, they're specifically banded together to to basically knowing each other's struggle and and being yes. positive about their, their positive steps towards that struggle there needs to be that uh, transparency and accountability. We need to create safe spaces where our uh, where men can have these conversations. Uh, we can't take a, an outright shame based approach. I, I'm not saying there shouldn't be any shame around this. I think if you're looking at rape porn, torture of porn, that is important. Child yep. sexual exploitation. <laughs> uh, there should be There's some an shame. shame. So I'm there. not totally anti shame. <laughs> However, uh, if we only use a guilt based <laughs> approach, that Young person, young man will end up in worse places, and I've seen I've seen it happen. If they don't feel they can be open, transparent, yeah. this is my struggle. Please help me. Um, yep. You know, they will end up in worse places. They'll end up in places they never thought they would go, and not be able to claw their way yeah. out of it. Well, Catholics talk about the difference between a shame and a guilt culture, um, mm. where the the shame culture is that once one strike and you're out, you're gone, you, you're irredeemable. Mm. But I think mm. what you, you're referring to here is it, there's guilt involved in certain activity, but it's mm. not beyond redemption, that you can, Correct. in fact, change Nothing right now. Today, Correct. it can actually be, get, be the first step in a journey. Tomorrow is a new day. What choices will you make? When you're fighting such a battle, the forces in us are so strong that mm. take no prisoners in, in the sense of go hard. Don't, don't mess around with this. I know some young men who have gone to the point of locking their laptop in their car parked, you know, down the other end of the road. I know men who have destroyed their laptop and their phone, smashed it to pieces. <laughs> it's the only way. Just in terms of absolutely not taking prisoners in this area, to, to go hard against it. No, don't muck around. Don't do half measures. Make sure if something is, is mastering you, make sure you show it what, who's boss and make sure that the 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 fight to be natural normal and healthy human relationships that never give up that fight it's 
Yes. Um, and and also, don't be scared to like other people might say, "Oh, you're going over the top." Don't. That's not mm. not their fight. That's your fight. Mm. So, Can I anyway. mention some resources, Peter, or you could just put them on the website? That'd later. be great. So Collective Shout, my website, melindatankardreese.com. Uh, the resources of the eSafety Commission are very good for parents, especially at this time of COVID lockdown with all the kids at home. Uh, excellent, accessible, easy to use resources provided by the eSafety Commission. Uh, for uh, faith-based uh, groups, individuals, resistporn.org, uh, which was uh, created by uh, Anglicans in Sydney, is actually has very good resources on there for parents, for youth groups, churches, a lot of free, very good resources there. Uh, also, Fight the New Drug for Young People. They'll find helpful resources there to help them to be accountable and uh, strong to help resist the um, encroaching of porn in their in their lives. Uh, so there are a few. I also have two books I recommend for parents that I sell through my website. One is called How to Talk to Your Kids About Porn. This is a difficult conversation. Really, we'd rather not have to have it, but we have no choice. There's a vacuum there and someone will fill it and they may not share our beliefs and ideals for our children. Uh, so How to Talk to Kids About Porn. And then a second book is called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, and that book you read with your child and it gives them practical strategies what to do if you see a bad picture it will empower them and equip them with strategies and help keep the conversation open. Uh, so those two are among the best I've, I've found to uh, help parents and to navigate this with their child. One of the things that I noted very early on in the 80s was that mm. uh, when, when I was looking at how sex sells, if you like, mm. I was mm. saying, well, actually, the reason they're using sexual imagery to sell things is that you can't sell love because love is a gift of free will. Well, yeah, I'm going to say two to things about that's... sex cells, which we don't have time for, but it's actually incorrect that sex cells. <laughs> uh, one, it's not sex. It's women's bodies that's being sold for a start. Okay. You're actually not selling sex at all. You're selling a, um okay. objectified portrayal of women's bodies. That's what that's what you're using to sell whatever. But two, the latest research shows that it actually isn't a su successful sales technique anymore. That's changed. Yeah. Ads like UltraTune and KFC last year during our major sporting broadcasts, uh, in the annual sporting calendar just took us back decades with these archaic stereotyped yeah. notions of, of women. Uh, our KFC campaign yeah. went global. That just went insane. Uh, and so many people agreed with us. So, you know, <laughs> there's other ways to uh, to advertise that don't result. It could have, that in, one could have been out of the 1950s, honestly. Yeah, exactly. Ad. Time for a, a new way of, of living and, and being and healthy, you know, community and empathy and emotional intelligence and community, social cohesion. And we're seeing, I think we're seeing a desire for that now in, in COVID. Yep. We're, seeing, we're seeing that desire to, to find things uh, that benefit us. You know, can we talk about going back to normal when normal probably wasn't that great? <laughs> you know, what does normal look like? What do we really want? As a yeah, society? that's a very good point. And maybe we what should. Are we really going to value? Maybe we should have a whole other episode on what does normal look like. I think so. <laughs> that's it for this week's podcast. If today's discussion got you thinking or arguing with your podcast device, let us know. We're really keen to engage in conversation with this. And if you think we've missed something, or we should have Melinda back again to talk about another aspect of it, we'd love to hear from you. You can subscribe to the website at thiscatholiclife.com.au. Send us a, an email at info at thiscatholiclife.com.au. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, all the ways in which you can link. Uh, all these links are on our website. Be sure to write us a review if you can. And remember that this is a uniquely Australian Catholic podcast. We think that's an idea worth getting behind. So tell your friends. Before we go, it's time for shout outs. Melinda, do you have a shout out? Uh, just a special shout out to all of our Collective Shout supporters. We couldn't do what we do uh, without you. We value uh, every one of you. There wouldn't be a Collective Shout without all those individuals that have supported us and joined the movement for 10 years now. And we were going to be having a big celebration around the country with all of our supporters. We can't do that, but we will be having a virtual celebration honouring everyone that has helped us in any way over the last decade. So look out for that uh, at collectiveshout.org and on our social media pages. Excellent. Um, my shout out today goes to all of the um, young men and women who've felt under pressure in various ways by the culture and stood up. You're not alone. Just keep standing up. 
keep supporting each other. If you see someone else stand up, stand beside them. It's little things, little standouts mm. that changed lots of different social movements, that changed mm. um, uh, the racism, that changed all sorts of other attitudes. Let's do it now. Let's stand up and be counted. That's all for now. Thank you for listening to This Catholic Life. Mm.